Well, I think one thing in this county, uh, there's still a feeling of the gold rush and that era. And I have surrounded myself with the, the buildings I've put up that make me feel like I'm still living in the 1800s. That's, that's, a, slower, that's a slowing down. Uh, even in my lifetime, I was born in 1931, and, and I notice over the years how much things have changed in my lifetime, which is almost 84 years now. And uh, I like that slower pace. I like that feeling of it, it, you have time to take time to do whatever you need to do and be friends with folks and stop and talk to them if they want to talk. Uh, I'm never too busy to stop and talk to someone if they want to ask me something about what we do up here. And I think that, that that's part of it. Uh, there's a lot of my, my uh, whole, my first memories of, of liking the, the, the country life. And, and I was four years old, we moved on to a homestead in Oregon during the Depression. And I knew right then that that was what I wanted. I knew that was my life. And that was being four years old, so, you know, it's, I had to follow that. And fortunately, I've married a, a lady who went along with those little idiosyncrasies, and, and uh, it's worked out real great for us. Okay, let's get into the uh, covered wagon. You made a modern journey in a covered wagon, but what would you pack for the trip in the 1800s? Well, uh, you, you have to start out, of course, with as much water as you can carry and as much dry meat and, and things as you can carry, but you can't carry very much in a wagon. We started out from here when we went across the United States with way too much stuff on our wagon, and we finally called uh, Marie's mom and said, come and get half the stuff we've got in the wagon. It's just stuff that gets in your way. You need good bed rolls. You need whatever food and water you can carry, but that runs out pretty quick. And then you have to hunt and pick berries along the way you know, to survive. I, I, uh, I envied those folks. Uh, they were made out of good stuff. There was that feeling of, when we went on the wagon train, we f I found out really quickly how tough women are in a situation like that. They, they out tough the men by a lot. I, I don't know why I should have been surprised because I've read a lot about the, the pioneers, what, what made that work. A lot of women left Missouri or wherever they were leaving from pregnant and had to deliver along the way. You can't imagine how awful that must have been for these women, but they did it. Partly because their husbands wanted, they couldn't stand being where they were. They wanted to move on, move on, move on. And they went along with it, and uh, at least the ones who, who did take the trip. And uh, they started out with furniture and things like that. And they, uh, the, the trail was just strewn with stuff that they had to throw up because the wagon had got too heavy for the teams. They got into the hill country, into, into the mountains, and they just had to unload everything and make that wagon as light as possible. In fact, most of them walked just to keep the wagons as light as possible. So you, you couldn't take much. Let me ask you, because uh, we, we've talked about how the wheels you know, were a real challenge mechanically. Did they, they didn't bring spare tires, did they? No, no. So what would you do if a, if a wheel broke, you just... Well the, well, the problem was most of those wagons were made back east at that time. And they didn't bolt the tires on like we have to do out here because we had a lot of shrinkage and expansion. I don't, I don't even build wheels in the wintertime here. I, I wait till the, the air is dry, which we have a lot of dry air here. So the wood is as dry as it can possibly be. But back there, it was built in the humidity. And they would bolt these or shrink the tires on, which you do with heat. And then they got out here into this drier country, and the wood would shrink away from the tires, and they'd fall. So they would start running shims, sticks and things in between the tires to keep them on, because they weren't bolted on. And even at that, it got so bad. And soaking them in the river would work for about three days, and then it would be all loose again, and maybe even a little worse than it was before, because the wood keeps losing oil every time you run it in the river and uh, soak it. And most of them didn't have the time to do that. They were moving on. And uh, so you just have to, uh, they had to make do. And a lot of them lost. If they start out with a four-wheeled wagon, sometimes they end up with the, the, the front two wheels because the back wheels were larger and they would tend to, tires would come off quicker. So they just break it down into a cart and, and load it or whatever they get on that cart and make it work. We talked about the food for humans, but I assume the, 
mules and the horses and everything, you just found whatever you had along oh, the yeah. way grazing. Yeah. Uh, when I went across the United States, we took mules because I, I, knowing mules, they can live on less quality food. But see, the, the pioneer when they started out with the oxen, oxen you maybe get 10 miles in a day. Then they went to horses, they could get 20, 25, depending on the terrain, of course. But the Indians wanted horses, that was their wealth. So when they could get mules, they would take mules. The Indians didn't want mules, that, that was not what they wanted. So, But they would stampede the oxen, if they would get them, and the guys were out there with their wagons with no way to pull them. Or they'd run the, or come and steal the horses, no way to pull their wagons. So the mules worked well for them if they could get them. They were a little harder to come by than, than horses, but uh, the ones who made it, a lot of them had good mules, and, and they were, and they could survive on whatever grass was out here in the, in the field along the way. And of course, water was a big problem because there were, if there wasn't rivers and springs along the way, you get four or five days in that hot western atmosphere, like Nevada, where there was no water. Uh, very few people rode. Uh, if they were coming with teams and wagons, most of the family would walk because they had to keep the wagons as light. You know, if they had little kids, sometimes they'd ride up in the wagon, but most people walked. Uh, if they, of course, they got lamed up, they would ride, but uh, the, the, you look at the old photographs of the wagons, they didn't have a driver's seat in like we have now. We have this spring seat up on the wagon box, and the driver sits up there, but most of the wagons, you see the old photographs, there was not a driver's seat. They would uh, either drive from the wheel horse, the left-hand wheel horse, or just walk and gee and hom and, and uh, do it without even a uh, hookup, uh, without drive lines. But uh, the teams had to be pretty well mannered to, to make them go without drive, without drive lines and things like that. But mostly from the ground. Well, the auction particularly, they, 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 they used a set of a whip, they used a goad with a, with a spike in the end of it, and they'd jab the auction in the, in the sides to keep them going. Well, when they first started, it was auction, because that's what they could get and they were tough. They could live on practically nothing. Because oxen are cud-chewing animals, they, they don't have upper teeth in the front. They, whatever they could find, they'd chew it and swallow it down whole, and then they have four stomachs. So that after they'd get into camp at night, they would lay down and they would they'd chew their cud. They have a process in their digestive system that makes them be able to survive on a lot less quality food than uh, horses or mules. But horses that, who came from, say, back east, that were raised on good grains and, and uh, good hay, a lot of them just couldn't survive on whatever they could find out there in the, in the field along the way. Sometimes there was nothing to, to, to eat, there was no, particularly when they got out here in the west. Going across Nevada was probably the worst part. You know, there was very little grass. And somebody who had made a, a, a map, made it into a book, all printed back east. They'd never even been here, and they, they showed a cutoff. It was supposed to make the trail shorter, and the cutoff ended up a lot of people died on that cutoff because it wasn't wasn't a shorter way. It was no water, but they sold a lot of maps that way, without even knowing where they where they were sending people. Well, a lot of the routes, of course, was uh, which is now Highway 88 or, or 80, and which is now 88, which is Carson Pass, and then there's other passes on down. Where some of them are higher, went up a lot higher and uh, were tougher. Uh, the one which is now Carson Pass was. Uh, a pretty uh, popular trail. And uh, the one that up on 80s where uh, a lot of the problems had, they, they got snowed in and uh, they had a lot of people died on that trail because the snows would come early and they'd be stranded up there with no way to get across. But uh, a friend of mine who, who liked to take metal detectors and go up on the, on the different Mormon trails and things like that where they came across, went up there with metal detectors, and I built them a Conestoga wagon, and they wanted to go up there and do it the old-fashioned way with horses and a wagon, so they take the metal detectors up there on the old trails, and they found, one day they were up there and they found a whole wagon buried. They got a lot of reading and they dug it out, and it was in the sandy, right at the top of the pass, about 12,000 feet, and they found this wagon had been buried there. Something had happened to the wagon, they couldn't pull it anymore, so they, I think the folks just buried it, figured they might come back up and pick it up later and fix it. They never did, and never was buried there. So they dug it up, and, and uh, I guess salvaged whatever they could out of it. They found some pots and pans in it, and a few things like that. But the trails were 
were rough, and boy, they were steep. And there were places where you had to, if you had maybe 10 wagons in the train, the, the got, train got so steep that they would stop at the base, unhook the teams from the other wagons, and maybe put six or eight spans and take a wagon up, bring the spans back down, hook to another wagon, and all the horses would, or mules would be working together to pull these wagons up over the steep part of the pass where just a team couldn't do it. A lot of places along, uh, once you got out of uh, New Mexico and into Arizona and, and uh, California, coming into California, just there were some real, st on the east side of the Sierras is just like a, a wall in places. <coughs> and some of the trails that were mapped out with people who didn't even see the road uh, mapped out and that they that map that road just hit that wall and that was the end of the trip as far as they had to make a town there <laughs> and uh, it would uh it worked out some of the towns are still there okay let's talk a bit about what you guys are doing was is the route that you're tracing is it just for fun or is it was it actually a route into jackson uh no it, it no what well, no we're just we're just uh trying to reproduce what, what it must have looked like back in the 1800s when the gold miners were coming in, the people were coming in to hear the, the, the gold word and they start coming to this area because they were, a lot of them were from other places and they had just lied, loading a wagon and come down to here where the big gold rush was. And uh, uh, we're just trying to reproduce that, that feeding of, of people, it's because it's 150th year of, of since the gold rush. So we're just kind of reproducing that feeling. Okay. <coughs> so uh, a lot of kids aren't getting uh, some of this in school like we used to get when we were kids. We heard about the gold rushes and the different, maybe they might in this county, I don't know, Zamater County, they might be getting it in school, but a lot of the kids aren't, aren't seeing this kind of thing. And for them to come out and see a wa actual wagon train with horses and mules and the sound of, of Horses run going down, lots of horses going down the road, and this might be their only introduction uh, in this to this point of their life that they've never seen before. And, and uh, hopefully, it'll it'll help them realize uh, what people had to do, the sacrifices they had to make just to be here. Uh, they had to pick up and leave home, not having any idea where they were going to, and come out here and. Make a town, settle a little, uh, maybe a gold rush, and then build a town around the gold rush till they would phase out. Sometimes people, would, some people would stay in this old town, and some people would move on to the next gold rush. And that's how a lot of little towns. There's the Sutter Creek and Amateur City and Dry Town and Jackson and Fiddletown. These are all little gold rush towns. Now Fiddletown still has about a hundred people actually live in the town. If there's that many now, but at one time I had a large Chinese uh, entanglement and and. Uh, they had a graveyard, and well, when the Chinese left this area, they dug up the graves and sent them back to China, which I guess was a habit that the Chinese did. So there's not much of a, of a graveyard left out there. But uh, towns just sort of evolved around, a lot of out here in the West evolved around uh, silver or gold or whatever else draw, drew a, a pe amount of people to an area. Well, usually it was gold or silver. And uh, a lot of them stayed, a lot of them just moved on. Well, I think that's good. I mean, um, I think it's terrific. I was going to hopefully uh, go over a map with you guys to see your route. But I hope I get to interview you at the, the fairgrounds. Maybe oh, yeah. It would be great to get the wagons circled. Oh, yeah. We're, yeah. We're gonna, we probably won't circle the wagons the first night. You're going to do a Kennedy on Saturday night? Yeah. yeah. And uh, because when we start out on the Bicentennial wagon train, there were nine wagons on our train, and I... I noticed we we get into camp and it'd be RVs and horse trailers and, and no rhyme or reason. So I, I talked to the wagon master. I said, you know, people come to see a wagon train, and uh, don't you think we ought to just circle the wagon, make it make it look like we are on a wagon train? So we started doing that, and uh, sometimes it was just too hard to do. The terrain was too steep, and we couldn't find a flat spot to camp so we just bring the wagons and the RVs and a lot of people they didn't we, we lived in our wagon we didn't even have a car with us so we slept in the wagon and uh, we tried to do it as, as close to the railway it was done as we could and I'm glad we did because we got more of a feeling of how it must have been when you 
live in your wagon, you know. Now this baby behind you is going to be in the... Yeah, yeah. And this one and the one parked in front of the saddle shed is going to be in the... Be, I know I've already interviewed you guys, but just talk about the history of this. This is a chuck wagon behind you. This wagon uh, I built probably five years ago. A guy came up here one day, he was on the way to the dump, and he had a wagon part, just a little... It's where the reach comes from the front axle to the back axle, and it's where the, the hounds divide, and it was a metal, cast metal, and it said Studebaker. It was a part of an old Studebaker wagon. So I thought, I'll build a wagon around this metal part. And I, I paint, painted Studebaker on the side. Actually, it's not a Studebaker wagon. It's a Schofield wagon. But, but this is a type of wagon that was a standard farm wagon, 10 feet long, 3 and a half feet wide. Yeah, the box is 3 and a half feet wide. And uh, thousands and thousands of them that were made, and a lot of the pioneers, the, the early pioneers brought the Conestogas from back east, built in the Conestoga Valley in Pennsylvania by Germans. Most of them were German craftsmen, excellent craftsmen. But they were heavy, big, heavy wagons, and, and much longer than these. So what, what the, uh, the opportunists saw that they could send them west with these wagons, and then they got the Missouri River, they were told that these wagons were way too heavy. You're going to have to get a lighter wagon. So they would sell them these con these size wagons, take the big Conestogas back east, and sell them to the pioneers who want to move. They kept re recycling these wagons and uh, selling new wagons to, to go on, on west. But this was very standard uh, farm wagon that uh, there were hundreds of shops that would make these. And uh, you could you could buy a wagon like this for a uh, hundred dollars in those days, which was a lot more money than it is now, but for sure, because these people would probably save up for years to get that hundred dollars they could spend on a on an extra wagon. Maybe uh, I know you said something. Like, could you just make a concluding statement about again what you're hoping to accomplish with the ride? Well. <clears throat> I've been uh, interested in this part of, the, of our history for all of my life. And that's one reason we went across the United States in a covered wagon. It took us six months to get across. And I was hoping that the kids who would come out, the schools, we'd go through a little town, the teachers would bring the kids out and they'd watch us go by and they'd wave. And I, I just want to see the, the 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 value and the kind of strength that the people had to have to settle this country, to give a respect for this country as it is right now. And you can't take any of it for granted. It was through a lot of hard sacrifices that what we have here is worth hanging on to and worth bringing back in history to, so that people who don't have a clue what it was like, that we can just show them a little bit of the sounds and, and the, the feelings of what it was like to just travel that way. You know, a person gets in a car and they drive three or four or five, six hundred miles in a day. Well, we did well, maybe 20 miles in a day in a wagon. And that would be a good day. So there's a lot of things that, if you start listing what we would do this for, it's simply to, to because part of us, our own self is to, to relive history for our own benefit. And some of it is to share with others that say, this is what it was like. This is what it sounded like. This is what it looked like. And uh, maybe bring that part of history into the kids that aren't seeing it. Uh, if they see it on television, they don't get the real feeling of how it must have felt like and sounded like. So if we can accomplish that, I'll, I'll be happy. That's all I need to know. That they, And uh, the teachers who, we used to bring them up here. And I'd hook the team up and pull logs and show them how teams worked. and. And the kids always just were absolutely fascinated with that. And the teachers would always be thankful that someone is still doing that kind of thing. So this is part of it. You know, it's, it's, it's a many faceted thing. But that's just part of the, of the thing. And, and uh, if I had time to sit down and write out why I do this, it'd be a long list. But that's the basic fundamentals of why I still do this. It's part for myself to relive what I like about our history and, and to show it to others. And hope, hopefully they, they get a, a, a touch of what I what I want them to see. Thank Perfect. You. Perfect day. Great day. Yeah. Loved it. Couldn't ask for a better day, really. Yeah. One of those.
That was Perfect the best day. scenery I think I've seen ever. Ever. It was yeah. gorgeous. Yeah. Yeah, yeah we yeah. Uh, started out this morning and it just went, got better and better going down oh. that canyon. Couldn't believe it. You were on that, weren't you? Yeah. Sure, he mm -hmm. was getting lots of pictures. Thought you were. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Actually, I think from all the scenery I've ever seen in my life, yeah. that was the best. Amador, Amador County is yeah. the you best. Yeah, can't beat it yeah. here. It's the best place in the world. Yeah, it is. Yeah.